I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles with me to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. I like the song they just sang, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. The world today is turning their eyes elsewhere, and because of that, there's a famine in the land. There's not a famine for food. There's not a famine for water. But there's a famine for morality, and there's a famine for the Word of God. We've got too many preachers out there preaching uh, things about uh, uh, how to improve yourself and how to feel good about yourself instead of what the Word of God says. You know, we have a new generation growing up without the knowledge of the Word of God. They lack the character that their grandparents had. They do not know what sin is. Things that we call sin, what the Bible calls sin, this newer generation calls as acceptable. Everybody does it. There's nothing wrong with it. Things that God calls an abomination, many of this newer generation, their close friends practice that, and some of them do themselves. Things that the government or religious organization says uh, that are okay, they relabel, uh, they're in the business of relabeling morality. What God calls sin and abomination, government and some religious organization, uh, they call it normal and acceptable. My friends, the government and certain religious organizations are focusing on the newer generation by encouraging them in their sinful lives. They're corrupt. They're corrupting these young people and they speak out and say abortion is right and it's healthy on the mother. They say the gay lifestyle is normal and right. They say cross-dressing is okay. Those things are not right. They're not okay. The younger generation is growing up with this council which will destroy our great nation. In the passage that we're going to read here in Leviticus chapter 26, I'm going to take you through several passages today. The Holy Spirit just guiding me and to change my message. He wants us to look at some things, what God calls sin. And then later on, I want to share some things about you, about the holiness of God and the righteousness of God. What we're going to read here, we're going to read about what God says it takes for a nation to be blessed by God. Notice verse 3. Notice the word if. If we walk in my statutes, God's saying this, and keep my commandments and do them, then I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and your threshing shall reach unto the vintage, and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time, and ye shall eat your bread uh, to the full and dwell in your land safely. Have you ever planted a garden? It didn't turn out so well. I've had a few of those, haven't you? You know, you plant it, and you just don't get the rain. And when you do get your harvest, I've had some uh, uh, squash. I pull it out from the garden, and it's hard and worthless. Terrible. Green beans really don't, you don't get enough to have a mess to eat. Terrible. But he's saying, if you follow me, these things will happen. Look at verse 6. And I will give you peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. I like that. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you. And make you fruitful and multiply you. And establish my covenant with you. And ye shall eat old store. You know what that means, eat old store? Stuff that you have saved up from last year. It's still there. You got plenty of it. You're getting the new stuff in. And then he says this. And bring forth the old because of the new. He says, well, you got so much of the new. You need to go ahead and just get rid of the old. Because you got enough to store for the next season as well. Verse 11, and I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. I am the Lord, uh, Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that ye, may, ye, ye should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands of your yoke, and made you go upright. God has got so many promises here where he's saying, listen. I'll put your enemies to flight. A sword won't go through your land. You know what that means? No terrorist attack. No riots going on. 
No evasion from another co country coming in into our land. Boy, that's the way it used to be. Now we have to worry about terrorist attack. Now we have to really be careful and, and, and worry about riots in our own streets. People are afraid about this next election. You know, and he's saying, listen, if you follow my ways, you'll not have any of that. Before I continue, let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ and through the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. And I ask that you cover me with your blood, Father. I pray that your Holy Spirit speak through me and that you speak to all of our hearts, Lord. Give us a sense and a desire and a hunger for your righteousness, for your morality, for your peace and your grace. Help us, Lord, to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. There's a strength that God gives to people who follow God. My kids and I, uh, uh, being in the ministry, I tell them often, they hear stuff, they see things, and they see so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, what happened to him and what happened to her. And what I share with them a lot, do you realize that our lives have been even killed? It's been steady. Our lives have been on a solid foundation because we follow God. You see this person over here, they're up, they're down, they're up, they're down. They're like a yo-yo. They're like a roller coaster. They're hot, they're cold. They're doing good, they're doing poor. Why is that? Because they don't follow God. You follow God and therefore you're blessed. You have strength. Those who follow Him and obey Him will live a, a stable and a consistent life. But all those who disobey God's principles and His laws will live a life of turmoil, a life of shortage, a life of suffering, a life of great loss and ups and downs. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what the Pope says. It doesn't matter what I say, but my friends, what matters is what does the Word of God preach? What does the Word of God say? One of the tenets of the Baptist faith, I'm sorry, let me just say one of the tenets of our church is the Bible is our, uh, the rule, is our uh, sole authority for faith and practice. We follow what the Bible says. That's our authority. In this passage, throughout the rest of it, we see some dangers of getting off the, the path of righteousness of those who do not follow God. Uh, look, uh, if you notice in verse 14, I'll not read these, but we will start at verse 15 in a minute. In verse 14, it has the words, if not. Verse 18 says, if ye will not, then hearken unto me. Verse 21, if ye walk contrary to me. Uh, 23, if ye will not be reformed. Verse 27, <clears throat> if ye will not hearken unto me. Now let's read these in verse 15. I want you to notice those phrases as we read. Verse 15, it says, If ye shall despise my statutes, and if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I will also do this unto you. I will even appoint over you, notice this, terror, consumption, and the burning og that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you. Do we want the face of God against us or for us? We want him for us. And ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. Do we have a lot of enemies as uh, citizens of the U.S.? Yes, we do. And ye shall flee when none pursueth you. Verse 18. And if ye will not, yet uh, if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. He's saying, if you go through this and you still not listen to me, I'm going to hit you seven times harder. Verse 19. And I will break the pride of your power. I will make you your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain. Uh, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield her fruits. And if he walk contrary unto me, contrary to the word of God, the things he says are uh, right, you call them wrong. The things he says are wrong, you call them right. If you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And it goes on and on and on. My friends, we need to get this understanding and we need to accept this. What God says he means. What God, God's word says, that's what we need to hold to. We need to understand something about God. In God's righteousness and judgment, his morality, his judgment, his holiness, 
God will perform the doing of it. What he says, he will do. Whether you believe it or not, whether I believe it or not, God will perform it. Whether the government speaks otherwise, whether the Pope says otherwise, it doesn't matter. What God says, God means. You say, preacher, why are you saying stuff like that? Oh, well, if you listen to the Pope, he says homosexuality is okay. It's not. It's an abomination. As a Christian, and when I say that, I'm talking about being a real Christian. Being a real Christian doesn't mean you're Catholic. Catholic doesn't make you a Christian. Being a Christian means you're born again. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't be a Christian by being a Baptist. You don't be a Christian by being a Catholic. You don't be a Christian by being a Jehovah Witness. You become a Christian when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. A real Christian, I've received him as my Savior. I have an advantage, and so do you. I have an advantage, and my advantage is that I have Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I have the Word of God that guides me through life. The Bible says in Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I'll not sin against God. And that's the key. I don't want to sin against God. If I, if I live a righteous life that does not sin against God, I'm going to be right by you. I'm going to do you right. I'm going to be uh, a good person to you, and so on. Many people sin against God because they do not know the Word of God. Many sin against God because they'll not believe someone else over the Word of They'll believe someone else over the Word of God. The Bible also says in Psalm 119, 128, He says, Therefore I re esteem all thy precepts, all of the Word of God, concerning all things to be right. God, everything that you say is right. And then he says, I and I hate every false way. I love that. Every, I hate every for, false way. This morning, I want us to read several portions of Scripture. And I want you and I to get the feel of what God says is right and wrong. As we read through these portions of Scripture, we will come across some things that the world says, they're okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But God says these things, some of these things are wicked. He says some of these things are abomination. And get this picture in your mind. Abomination doesn't change. If it was an abomination in the Old Testament, it's still an abomination today. In the Old Testament, there's 613 Old Testament laws that the Jews were not to, uh, that, that they were to adhere to. Now there's some of those laws, for instance, dietary laws have changed. But there's things in here that will never change. If it was an abomination then, it's abomination now. I want you to see some of the things that God calls sin, things that he calls an abomination. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to see the holiness and the love of God that he has for all sinners. What are some of the things that God calls sin? Look over to Leviticus chapter 18 with me. Leviticus chapter 18 will begin in verse 5. We're going to read several verses and see some of the things that God calls sin. These were laws. Now, we're going to look at different types of laws. This one particular passage has to do with nakedness. All right? Verse 5, ye, ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. All right? Verse 6, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. He says, I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father or the daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness thou shalt not uncover. Now, I'll not read these, but in verse 10, uh, 10 it, calls, it talks about thy son's daughter or thy daughter's daughter. In other words, your grandchildren. Verses 12 and 13, it talks about your aunt. Verse 15, your daughter-in-law. Verse 16, your sister-in-law. Verse 20, your neighbor's wife. These are things that God says you're not to look at the nakedness of these people. You're not to uncover their nakedness, and you're not to look at it. But yet, Americans today, they'll walk around in their boxers. They don't mind doing some of the things that God says is wrong. A lot of this stuff takes place in the home, and God says, that's wicked. 
He has a reason for it. There are laws concerning sodomy and homosexuality, which is the same thing. Look at verse 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is a, what's the next word, folks? Abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. You don't do those things, but people do them today. Verse 22 speaks about homosexuality. Verse 23 speaks about bestiality. In Leviticus chapter 20, keep your finger here, go to chapter 20, verse 13. We're going to get a little bit more specific about homosexuality. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Is that clear? Do we understand what that's talking about? That's sodomy. That's homosexuality, all right? Then he says, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. You know, God is very specific. This is something he abhors. It's a sin, yes. But it's, it's something that God just says, really? Serious? Have you got that perverted in your perversion? How could you get that low? It disgusts him. He, it, he despises him. But my goodness, you preach on this stuff. A lot of people know homosexuals. A lot of people know sodomites. A lot of people know bisexuals. A lot of people know transgender transvestites. And so they get offended. They get mad. This happens to me all the time as a preacher. And, but like a friend told me, they're not mad at me. They're mad at God's word. Another argument, keep your finger here. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. So one of the arguments that people give, well, preacher, that's Old Testament. That's outdated. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, old and new. Well, let me give it to you in the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. For this cause, you read the rest of the context to figure out what he's talking about. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. All right? For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which is meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Old and new are the same. Both call it an abomination. Both say it's wrong. It doesn't matter if the government says it's okay. It's not okay. It doesn't matter if the Pope says it's right. It is not right. It's an abomination to God. It's wicked. It's sinful. And it destroys a nation. And God says, put them to death. Now our government, they're responsible for that. King Asa in the Bible, we preached about this a couple of weeks ago. King Asa in the Bible was blessed of God because one of the things it says, and we read it here together, is Asa was blessed because he put the Sodomites out of the land. He got them out. And God blessed the nation. And because of that, there was peace in his nation. See, God knows what he's talking about. We want that peace. Therefore, we need to obey God. Now, let me move on a little bit. There's another laws. The next one, back to Leviticus chapter 19. Go over there, verse 28. These are laws concerning cutting and tattooing. All right? People wonder where this is in the Bible. Here you go. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. God says, I made you. You don't do that. Then he says, do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. All right, we understand both those. Tattooing. I know a young lady. She lost her baby. She had the tattoo right here on her chest. God says, don't do that. Men, they'll lose a wife. They'll lose a dad. They'll lose a mother. They'll get the picture of them tattooed on her. God says, don't do that. I am the Lord. We are to be like our Father in heaven. You say, preacher, I've already done those things. What do I do? Ask God to forgive and just move on. Serve God. That's all you do. Ask Him to forgive you and move on. See, the, these are things He said don't do. 
all right? Uh, verse 29 talks about selling other people out for sex. You don't do those things. It destroys the nation. And can you imagine what it does to the person that's being abused like that? It destroys their life. The next one, laws concerning witchcraft and familiar spirits. Leviticus 19.31. Regard not them which have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. Then he says, I am the Lord your God. You don't need a wizard. You don't need familiar spirits. You don't need seance. Come to me with your questions. Come to me with your problems. God is greater than all of them. You say, preacher, are there such things as, as evil spirits and stuff like that? Yes, there is. You've got angels in heaven. You've got fallen angels which have become demons. There is a demonic spiritual world out there. It's alive. It's real. They do influence people. Some do possess people. But my friend, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I've seen things. You've seen things. That stuff is alive and it's real. And I've got the greatest spirit. I've got the Holy Spirit of God that guides me in life and through life. All right? Um, so it talks about that. They have laws concerning adultery, incest, per, uh, perversion. Look at chapter 20, verse 10. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. It says, The man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife uh, hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. Verse 13, if a man also lie with a mankind as lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that there is be no wickedness among them. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and ye shall slay the beast. If a woman approach unto any beach, beast to lie down thereto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon him. Is God serious about this stuff? Yes. And you know what the world says? That's nuts. I don't believe the Bible. Ah, it's mean. It's violent. No, it's because they're wicked. They defile the land. They brought judgment on the land. They have to defend themselves. My friends, God is right. They don't believe in a God in heaven. They even want to say God, God accepts them the way they are. God didn't make them that way. He made us the male and female, no other. Some of the things, the forms you fill out. I was filling out a survey the other day, and it says male, female, or other. What all there is there? I don't know. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? That's just crazy. All right, well, I went to, never mind. Okay. Um, <laughs> Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. God's people are to be holy. We're to be dedicated to God, he says. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the Lord, for I the Lord am holy and have uh, severed you from other people. Oh, we're separate, we're special, that ye should be mine. A man also or a woman that hath a spirit or a wizard shall be put to death. And it goes on. But he says, you're mine. I've separated you from them. Now there's something you and I need to understand. Yes, the world is full of those, those people. But when a person accepts Christ as their Savior, they come out from that. They stop doing these things. I do know a homosexual has been saved and they stop being homosexuals. And that's my desire, is for them to come to Jesus Christ and stop their wickedness. My desire for those who uh, worship demonic powers and demons and wizardry and all that is for them to come to Jesus Christ and experience the true power that comes from God. They're going to die and go to hell if they continue going in that direction. They're deceived. And they live a lifestyle that is not healthy, that's not good. We're to be dedicated to God. We belong to Him. He says, he says, and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. He says, you belong to me. Let me ask you something. I was telling the class earlier this morning, I have five boys, one girl. 
people have made the comment about my boys, wow, they all look like you. And I'm thinking, yeah, I sure hope so. <laughs> Those are my kids. <laughs> That's a good thing that they look like their daddy. Amen? All right, they look like me. I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm to be like him. And the more I grow in him, the more I become like him. And the only way I can become more like him is the more I separate from the world. And the more I turn my eyes upon Jesus, the more I follow him, the more I become like him. And that's what God wants. That's what he wants for you. And let me ask you, is God good? Yes, he is all the time. Is God faithful? Yes, he is. Does he take care of his children? Yes, he does. God is powerful. He's wise. He's good. He's strong. He's mighty. And the more you become like him, the more you gain all those qualities as well. Let me go on a little bit. Uh, I gave us laws concerning helping others. Look at, um, go to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. I'm seeing if we're coming back to Leviticus. I don't think so. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Laws concerning helping others. Verse 1. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. Verse 2. And if thy brother be not nigh or near unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house. And it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it. And thou shalt restore it to him again verse 3 in like manner shalt thou do with his ass and so shalt thou do with his raiment uh, and with all lost thing of thy brothers which he has lost and thou hast found shalt thou do likewise thou mayest not hide thyself thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down in the way and hide thyself from them thou shalt surely help him and lift him up again you know what he's saying guy lost his mule he lost his donkey he lost his uh cow or a sheep or his goat he says or he dropped his coat on the road and you know it says you pick it up you take it to him if he doesn't live close to you take it home and when he comes by say hey buddy you lost this oh thank you why because god cares god cares about your possessions he cares about his possessions he wants us uh, to have he wants us to have what we need he wants us to be blessed by him and if we lose something, and you know what cost us something for that coat. You know what cost something for that ox. He says, man, that costs a lot of money. Help your brother out. Give it back to him. Don't go hide and pretend you didn't see it. And that's what the common person does today. Pick it up. Give it to him. If he, if he lives far away from you, he'll come to you and give it back to him. See, God cares. Uh, go to t chapter 22, verse 5. Verse 5, it says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Uh-oh, what is that talking about? Cross-dressing? I'm not to wear women's clothing. And ladies, you're not to wear men's clothing. I am not a woman, I am a man. And I'm to look like a man and act like a man and talk like a man. One of the things I despise is when a man talks like a woman and tries to look like a woman and act like a woman. That's just gross. That's disgusting. That's not right. That's pathetic. It's perverted. I hate even trying to mimic it, you know. Can you imagine putting your face up to a lovely 5 o'clock shadow? Yuck. <laughs> We were doing some self-defense the other day, and uh, uh, the guy I was working with, uh, he's bald, and he's got some bristles on there, and we were grabbing and everything and going, and they started joking around. I said, man, I got carpet burns on my hands from his head <laughs> and his face. That's, ladies, I don't know how you put up with this sometimes, but that's not something that turns me on, that's for sure. All right? All right. He says, these things are an abomination. They're disgusting. They're not right. In the Old Testament, now not keep reading on all these. In the Old Testament, there are 613 Old Testament laws. God had these for his people so they'd be separated unto him. As you read in Deuteronomy, he said so that the world would look at his people and say, you are a great people that have got holy laws. You're a great people that are blessed by God. 
that God has made powerful. He says, where all the nations of the world come to them. Now, many of us are old enough to remember some days during the days of Reagan when we were a powerful nation. The world feared us. The world respected us. When we talked, they listened. I don't care if they hated us. As long as they respected us, that's good. All right? And so... Got, there's 613 Old Testament laws, and God had them there. They're very detailed. They're very specific of things that will destroy us. And we're doing a lot of them today. And the problem is, you might know somebody who does those things, and it might make you mad. My friend, the Word of God and the laws of God was given to be a blessing and not a curse. We look at a small portion of things that God calls sin. Now let's look at some of the holiness of God that reveals His love to sinners. Go over, you're in Deuteronomy, go to chapter 4. God gave us an advantage by giving us His Word. He gave us an advantage. He sets us apart from the rest of the world by giving us His Word and, uh, as we follow Him. Look at verse 5, Deuteronomy 4, 5. He says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord thy, my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Now notice this, verse 6. Keep therefore and do them, for this is what? Your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. And read the rest of that passage so the world looks at you. Then he warns, skip down to verse 9. Only take heed to thyself. Keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen. Lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. My friends, we have a responsibility Teach your children. Teach your grandchildren the Word of God. They're getting something else in the public school that's not godly. A lot of these young people are growing up and they do not know what sin is. They don't know. They're being taught the things that God says is an abomination. Oh, it's natural. It's okay. It's not okay. It'll bring destruction into your life. All right? And we have this responsibility to teach the next generation. What I want you to do, I want, to ma- want you to make your own decisions. Uh, this is the decision I want you to think about real quick. Will you decide that as you look at the Word of God, would you decide with God versus the world? When you hear the government saying this, or the Pope saying this, or religion saying this, or the school sy- system saying this, will you compare it to see what the Bible says? And if there's a difference, will you side with God? That's a decision we all need to make. Will you love what God loves? Will you hate what God hates? What God calls sin, will you call it sin? What God calls an abomination, will it disgust you as well? If you love God, you will. And that, I'd like to ask you to make that decision today. God warned His people, Israel, about the dangers of following the rest of the world. He warned them of wanting to be like them. Let me uh, ask you to turn with me to John chapter 1. God gave us an advantage. One, He's given us Jesus Christ. Two, He's given us His Son. I'm I'm sorry, He's given us the Word of God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we see that Jesus Christ is the Word. It's capitalized. John chapter 1 in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Notice that that is capitalized. That's a name. That's Jesus Christ. It describes Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Skip down to verse 14. Notice this. This is Jesus. And the Word was made flesh. We've seen that Jesus Christ was, is, and will be. Jesus Christ created the world. He knows us. He created you and me. And now Jesus, the Word, becomes flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is a gift for you and me. He came, He's the very embodiment of the Word of God given to man to show God's love to man because the Bible tells us that we're all sinners. 
But the Bible also says in John 1, look down at verse 17, we're concerning, remember Old Testament law that we read? For the law was given by Moses, all right? But grace and truth was given by Jesus Christ. Say, preacher, what does that mean? Grace and truth, the truth, the law given by Moses. I can't keep it. You can't keep it. But grace, I don't deserve grace. Where God gives me favor in spite of me. He gives me mercy that I don't deserve. He gives me blessings that I don't deserve. That comes through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He came to save sinners. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to see the work that Jesus Christ has done for us. As we read in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, many verses, and there's so many more, talking about the wickedness of sin. These are things that we're not to do. We do them. We've done them. All right, we understand that. Well, is there grace? Is there truth? Yes, it's through Jesus Christ. How is he the grace? How is he the truth? What has he done? Hebrews 10, verse 8 says, Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Notice that, all right? The offering that man made for sin was the offering up of the life of an animal. And the Bible says that God had no pleasure in that. Why? Because it wasn't complete. It was temporary. It was a fix. It was a temporary fix for a moment. It never washed away sins forever. It couldn't. It was powerless. And man continued as a sinner. All right? We needed something that would complete the sacrifice, that would thoroughly wash away our sins. But notice verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. What is the first? What is the second? The first is the Old Testament law. All right. Now, is it taken away? No, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's all profitable. We know by the Old Testament law what God hates. We know how God thinks. We know what is an abomination to him then is still abomination to him now. All right. The first. How does he take it away? He completed it. He finished it. He is the only one who fulfilled it. Why? So that he can establish the second. In other words, the law, what the law did, the law says the law must be um, completed. The law must, uh, you've got to pay for your sins if you break the law. There's retaliation there. There's vengeance there. There's there's where you've you've got to pay for the price for your sin. All right, I can't do it. The Bible says, for all of sin come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners. We're all guilty before the law, and the law condemns us all as guilty. Is there any hope? Well, Jesus says he takes away the first. He takes away the guilt. He takes away the punishment for it because he's, he's already taken that punishment. That he may establish the second, and the second is grace. Now, remember, All 613 laws have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 10. It says, by the which will we are sanctified. Was that word sanctified? We're made complete. We're made pure. We're made holy. We're sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He died once. He died for all. How many of our sins did he pay for? All of them. Every single one. You mean even the sins I've not yet committed? Yes. That's why in John chapter 3, God requires a spiritual birth. I've got that physical birth. I was born a long, long time ago. But I received Jesus Christ as my Savior in 1993, I believe it was. Somewhere in there. But when when I was 28 years old, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. All right? That's when I was born again. I became a Christian when I was 28 years old. I received the spiritual birth. Now, I still have the flesh, but that spiritual birth has to grow. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. Now, I'm going to read this. Go back to Hebrews chapter 10, but let me read 1 John 2, 2. What is Jesus Christ? And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of of the whole world. Jesus died for everybody's sins. There's a group out there that says, 
Well, God knows who's going. Uh, God has determined you're going to be saved, and you're not going to be saved. No, He's not. That's a lie from hell. God died for everyone. He paid for the sins of everyone. That whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anybody can be saved, but you've got to come to Him. All right. And so He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the one that settled the price. He paid the price. He brought satisfaction to the law. He paid for all the sins of all mankind once and for all forever. Now go back to Hebrews 10, 11. He talks about the Old Testament priests. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes, notice the word oftentimes, the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting his enemies to be made his footstool, for by one offering, notice this, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He's perfected me forever. Preacher, do you still sin? Yeah, I do. You see, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, he paid for all my sins from the beginning to the end. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. But when I received Christ, I also received a spiritual birth. I'm a child of God through the blood of Jesus. I'm going to heaven. And now I'm still going to heaven, but when I sin as a son of God through Christ, I ask my father, Father, I did it again. Will you forgive me? I just ask him to forgive me. And I restore that fellowship, that relationship with my father. Parents, you know this. When your child does wrong, it kind of breaks that fellowship. You don't want to talk. You know what I mean? There's a wall between the two of you. It doesn't stop that relationship. They're still your child. That, that never will change. But what restores the fellowship? An apology. I am perfected forever because of what Jesus did. And I received that free gift because of what he did. He completely satisfied all the requirements of the law. That's what he means. He took away the first that he may establish the second. I, tr I do right now because of Jesus Christ. I can't fulfill that law. It's impossible for me. But Jesus did it for me. And now I follow him. I follow his ways. I follow his paths. The things that the Old Testament says are wrong and wicked, they're still wrong and wicked, but because of me being in Him, I don't want anything to do with those things. I want to be like my Father in Heaven. I've turned my eyes unto Jesus. I'm following Him in His ways. You see, here's the thing. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. The world around us is getting sicker and sicker. The morality is getting worse and worse. And somebody's got to stand up. Somebody's got to live for God. Somebody's got to say, that's not right. That's not acceptable. And saying that, we've got to follow our Father in heaven. We've got to live for Him. We've got to be the light. We've got to be the shining light for everybody to see. You're stable. What you have is right. And I want to have what you have. Will you determine in your heart not to accept the morality of the world? Will you determine in your heart that you're going to look at God's word and believe what his word says versus a religion or the government or the school system or what friends say? Can you determine to do that? You know what that requires? Number one, for you to be saved, to know God, let him be your father. Number two, it requires you to be faithful in God's house. Number three, it requires you to be in the Bible yourself. I don't expect you to believe me, but I do expect you to believe the Bible. And if you believe the Bible and I'm preaching the Bible, you're going to say, amen, I know that's true. We have an obligation. I'm accountable to God and you're accountable to God. Our lives to him for what he says in his word. And my friends, if you follow his ways, he will bless you. He will strengthen you. He will empower you. And that's all I ask. You say, let God be true and every man a liar. If he says it in his word, I'll believe it. I'll love what God loves. I'll hate what God hates. And I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus because Jesus loves sinners. And Jesus saved me from all my sins. 
and the world out there living in sin, I don't condemn them. I want them to be saved. I want them to have the same peace in their heart that God gave me when I came to Jesus Christ. I want all their sins forgiven and washed away too. But it takes not just one of us, it takes all of us working together. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name.